Good afternoon. I hope everyone's well and safe. I'm Richard McClellan, Sales Director at Advances UK and Ireland. Thanks for joining our webinar um, today. It's been in partnership with um, the Association of Security Consultants. We're going to hear from um, Supremas Jamie McMillan on facial recognition, giving us an insight into the contactless world. Michael Lee from NEDAP will be talking about how to apply best of breed technologies to security designs. And then finally, Advances' very own Alan Dickinson discusses what open integration really means in an integrated world. All of these presentations have some commonality in relation to the importance of technology partnerships in ensuring that an integrated solution um, is optimized. There is a Q&A section on the webinar control panel whereby you can ask questions throughout duration and will endeavour to answer, answer those as the presentations are being delivered. However, we also have a short Q&A between each speaker where I'll facilitate a few key questions to our subject matter experts. Whatever I do, I'll now hand over to um, Supremas Jamie McMillan. He's the Managing Director for UK and Ireland. So over to you. Jamie. Thank you, Richard. Okay, um, thanks very much, Richard. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar today. Um, thanks very much for giving your time to listen to the views of, of myself at Suprema, the NEDAP and Advances guys. Um, I hope this gives you a good introduction to our thoughts on the business and security market in the next hour or so. Um, I'd just like to take 20 minutes now to discuss um, a few of the contacts, contactless solutions in the world of access control uh, and spe specifically talk around um, our sort of dedication to, to integration. Um, what I'd like to what I'd like to just kick off with um, is a brief introduction of myself. Um, so Jamie McMillan, Managing Director of Suprema UK in Ireland. <clears throat> I've been in the security industry for approximately 20 years, or in fact 20 years uh, this year, uh, working uh, initially in distribution and supply chain. Uh, for the last 10 years. Um, I've been working in access control and door entry from a business development point of view. Uh, and uh, for eight of those years have worked both indirectly uh, and uh, latterly directly for Suprema uh, in the UK and their introduction into the UK market 15 years ago. Um, so specifically biometrics, uh, originally uh, fingerprint technology, um, but focusing on access control and time in attendance and getting our technology integrated into partnerships like NEDAP and Advances. So in terms of the content of what I'd like to talk through, um, initially I want to review the importance of partnership and integration and why that, why that really is a key marker for us uh, at, at Suprema. Uh, the evolution of the access control authentication world, uh, where we see ourselves now, or certainly where Suprema uh, and myself see things. Um, we'll move on to the adoption of contactless technology. Just a bit of an overview of how we see the market in some of the reports that uh, when you look into the, the world of access control, why topics such as face recognition and, and mobile credential come about and why we need to be really um, considerate as to how we sort of develop these uh, conversations with the end users and clients that we all work with and for. So the two key areas really, uh, the main focus on facial recognition, but also I'll touch at the end on mobile credential technology and where I see see that, or certainly where Suprema sees that and how we need to start considering that and also educating the marketplace and, and particularly the end users in that respect. So importance and uh, of partnership and integration. Um, this slide is something that I've used uh, frequently over the years. Um, 
but I think it's a good summary of what we've seen in the industry over the last 10 to 15 years. Initially with fingerprint, um, everyone considers biometric to be specifically fingerprint based, but actually it applies to everything um, that's about you personally and you as yourself. So facial recognition fits perfectly in that. So like I say, it started specifically as a review of biometrics and why adoption was slow to take off. Um, but on reflection recently, and particularly in the last sort of five to six weeks, this rings true not just of fingerprint, but of the facial recognition market and most other introductions of technology into access control specifically. Um, so let's focus on the introduction of contactless, so facial recognition uh, and um, and mobile credential um, in, in this industry, in this, this marketplace. So certainly from a facial recognition point of view, the, the relative cost of, of the technology has always been a, a burden or a restriction on people adopting it. And in fact, what we would typically see is that people dismiss it without even exploring the option because they just assume that the technology is going to be too expensive for their market need or their their industry or business need um the, the 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 next two really combine themselves but particularly complexity of of in both installation but also from an end user point of view and administration and this really sits perfectly in the space of integration so the expectation from from the end user and the integrator and, and possibly consultant, but, but less and less so, is that you know biometrics and specifically facial recognition um, is an add-on solution to something like a NEDAP product. Um, and typically in the in the past, it certainly has been, and, and there's a lot of duplication, uh, wiring configuration from an engineer's standpoint have all been very difficult for them to, to swallow, really. So why would I apply new technology when it's just going to cost me a fortune to do it, the product's expensive, the support's not there, and when I eventually get it to my end user, then I'm going to have to educate them all over again when they're very comfortable in what they're doing at the moment with their existing need app solution, for example. It's very important that we address the need to make our product as an industry, as a biometric and a facial recognition industry, make them easy to install, cost effective, but most importantly, that the end user feels like they're getting added benefit and it's not creating confusion and complexity. So in terms of the evolution of access control, You know, we've certainly seen a great shift in the last 18 months in terms of using passwords, we believe, whilst um, they still exist, particularly in smartphone apps, most providers um, have options to use biometrics for authentication and more and more, um, and I'll touch on it a little later, um, the use of facial recognition within technology. So that as the mobile phone market change, it changes, it, it heavily influences the adoption of facial recognition particularly. Um, we saw that, you know, four or five years ago on the fingerprint technology side of things, and we're certainly seeing it now in face recognition and, um, and voice recognition, actually, um, as things move on. Um, largely, we live in a world that still lives in RFID, smart card um, technology, um, but there's definitely a shift happening, and particularly in the mobile credential side of things. So um, greater security, flexibility to manage credential on device, and um, even not requiring anything other than yourself. You know, what greater identifier than that is there? Um, there's certainly a, a crossroads where uh, security meets convenience. Um, and, and the current um, unfortunate COVID-19 situation certainly made people question that. Um, which leads us to contactless environment. So, you know, the fingerprint uh, technology has taken a bit of a hammering over the last few weeks and months, um, and, and certainly face recognition is, is front and centre um, in, in the conversations that we're having, certainly, in that respect. So in terms of the adoption of contactless technology, and another slide that we like to, to sort of go back to, and I think it's really applicable, 
Um, so we use this frequently to demonstrate the shift in acceptance of biometrics and, and more, more recently facial recognition technology. Uh, and this all sort of goes back to what I was saying about the mobile industry helping adoption of, of our technology, particularly facial recognition. So the facial recognition model um, and, and now mobile credential fits this. So what we're saying in here is, is largely that 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 yellow circle that we show there is is showing the the, the trillions of transactions of of um, biometric and facial recognition that's happening on a daily basis and the fact that we're meeting that security and convenience crossroads that are referred to in the previous slide you know apple and sam's done uh, and and most smartphone providers are helping facilitate this but from an end user and a client point of view there's a real demand um, for this type of technology and what they need is an education on where they can get it. So as an industry, what we need to do and um, what we must do, what must do, excuse me, is help el educate the end user and the client that it's available now um, and how we can ensure that it's secure. And most importantly, how it's cost effective, relatively simple to install um, and end user and admin friendly. And, and this all goes back again to my comment there, that integration allows us to communicate all of those things, those three sort of pillars um, confidently, because we know through the work and the relationships that we have with these guys, that we can deploy facial recognition and mobile credential contactless technology in a fast, efficient and relatively cost effective way with a, with a good support structure behind it from all of the parties involved. <clears throat> so more detail around the facial recognition uh, market. Um, so how is the market really? Is face recognition just a buzzword? What's the market truly that, uh, that lies ahead for us? Well, in fact, all leading market research will have you believe that face recognition will be the fastest growing biometrics in the years to come, um, if not um, already. So if you think about it, facial recognition is really the oldest form of human ID. And, and, you know, it's a bit cheesy to say that, but, you know, it, it's true. You know, who we see um, and, and who we recognize determines whether we say a hello, whether we introduce ourselves, whether we allow someone in, whether we deny access. So we're really going back to something that we've all been doing from the, you know, from the, the day and hour we were capable of doing it personally. So what is the most commonly used ID today? You know, we talk biometrics, we talk mobiles, we talk RFID, but you know, picture ID is still our means of identification for everything that we do as an individual in our everyday lives. So we're expecting a huge global growth in the next four to five years. Asia is definitely adopting it fast. Um, and then we're looking Europe and North America uh, and latterly Latin America and, and Africa. But I think, Again, you know, the four to five weeks, albeit it's very hot topic and it's all very um, on trend, but certainly, um, you know, it's fair to say that anyone on LinkedIn, um, if they weren't aware of the options for face recognition, um, they certainly should be now. I mean, you can't move um, on social media for the, the manufacturers um, showing what they're capable of doing. So fingerprint still remains the primary solution in biometrics, but as we enter a contactless world, um, the options available, face recognition is stealing a march. It definitely goes back to the previous comment. It's the oldest form of ID and it's not invasive. That's really key, I think, in this whole contactless experience is the end user's ability to use it, not seamlessly, but having the least amount of impact on their day-to-day -day lives. The current climate is definitely challenging um, in the fingerprint market. I do believe it will recover, but it's allowing the market to realise the true benefit of facial recognition and the relative cost options that are available to them. So keeping up with market trends, uh, it's always a good way to tell if technology is hot by searching on your mobile app store. Actually, if you search for facial recognition, uh, on Google Play um, once you're done with this webinar you'll find a huge amount of apps and it's exactly what I did all of these things do exactly the same thing which is to open your phone using visual face verification 
for your front cameras. So the technology has been developed, whether it's for really simple applications or whether it's for high end, high traffic, um, commercial, high secure applications. The technology is in use in everyday life and the market is definitely um, switched onto it and the end users uh, are really um, uh, encouraged and uh, keen to adopt the technology. I think some of the things that we need to do as a market from an education point of view is educate on precisely what information is being handled. So we talk very briefly here in terms of technically, um, and I won't get any more um, detailed than this at the moment, but visual veri verification works very much on lines and edges of landmarks on your face, such as your eyes, nose and lips. Um, and the information is managed by unique algorithms, extracting data, uh, storing them in encrypted formats and databases. Most, if not all of your manufacturers have similar yet slightly different methods and algorithms to capture the information. But the effort and the, in effect, um, the data that is taken is the same. It's, it's important to not, as an observation, um, before closing on the topic, um, albeit there's a clamor for manufacturers about hygiene and health and safety and thermal imaging and things like these, these things do come at a cost. And it's really important for us, both as manufacturers and in, as an industry, to consider this before we get our clients and our customers to make huge investments for the long term with short term mentality. And what I mean by that is consider how this practically is going to be used and how you're going to integrate the solution with what's existing in your client's current setup. You know, how are they going to use it? It all goes back to those three key pillars, the cost, the complexity and the ability that they have to administer it themselves um, without too much interaction with you um, in support of it. So with all the information that we've got, uh, that I've discussed there, GDPR, is, uh, GDPR sorry, is still very important to consider. Um, I provided brief detail on how the information is captured and stored. We can provide lots more off the back of this. Um, you'll be able to contact us once the webinar's finished. Um, but any manufacturer should be able to provide you with the methods to ensure GDPR compliance is there and documentation available to support it. So if you need that information, please just ask, whether it's ourselves at Suprema or it's another manufacturer, it doesn't matter. You know, you and your clients need to have that um, peace of mind that what you're investing in has both got the support from your access control manufacturer, but also from us as the manufacturer of the hardware um, from a security and data protection point of view. And just finally on facial recognition, what I'd like to do is just come back to that first slide. slide. Um, consideration should be at the forefront of the decision that made. Um, ensure the end user gets the best, most simple product to use for a price that gives them satisfaction and long-term support. It's absolutely critical. Um, how will we work with what's in place already is the most important consideration. Um, and allow for the current access control system, making sure it's fit for purpose and that the product that you select um, is compatible and has the backing of every party involved. So we're going to move now um, and touch on mobile credential technology. Uh, a little briefer, but just really to, I'd say whet the appetites, but just give you some sort of idea on where we see things. You know, how do we incorporate this technology and market into the security industry? You know, um, I think, there's some information out there in the market that nearly 20% of all FOB and card holders, RFID card holders, will lose their credential in the course of a year. You know, that's something to really consider when you start talking about recurring costs for the client. 90% um, of all smartphone users are never more than three meters away from it. You know, I certainly know that rings true in my household, and I'm sure that could be echoed across not just this country, but most countries where um, the technology is used. Um, just one thing that I wanted to touch on, I got told this by someone the other day, if someone's one mile from home and has left their RFID fob or card behind, they're likely to keep going to work. If they're one mile from work and they've left their phone behind, they're likely to go home and get it. 
and be late for work. So that's just something, you know, I, that's really interesting to think about. And it's certainly something that, you know, I think is, you know, you see it every day when I look at, at, at businesses and companies and people's interaction with their workplace. Um, the other side of that is, you know, uh, the, the, the emergence of mobile credential allows us to consider all sorts of things from multi-factor authentication, um, the ability to provide mass notification and location awareness. Obviously, it's important to consider um, personal safety and um, data protection in all of those. Um, but the one that's really interesting, I think, is the ability for mass management of revoking credentials and lockdown situations. Um, and certainly it's applicable. And I think that it gives more flexibility to, client, uh, to clients when they consider how they move their access control solutions in the future. Just touching on um, on the cost of buy um, of, of mobile credentials and and um, and recurring costs of these things, you know we've come from a world of really unsafe uh, RFID technology and props and MyFair Classic and things like that, and you know we do have security in the, certainly the enterprise end with um, the type of technology that HIDI class, CIOS and Desfire EV1, EV2 particularly give us. Um, but there's a cost that's incurred in there. Um, you know, we do believe that mobile credential allows the market to adopt greater security um, and at a reduced cost. It is early days to consider it, but with a reduction of lost and replaced credentials, it's certainly valid to consider for your customer and, and certainly to look at um, when you're costing and, and putting these exercises together. In terms of the um, the questions that we're getting asked around um, uh, mobile credentials, it's all very much around flow of activation. So it's very easy to issue cards. How am I going to do that when I don't have either ownership or access to the mobile device that I'm providing that information to? So all of these things need to be considered. How quick the cards um, or the mobile code card speed is compared to what we're using currently. Um, and then, you know, bottom line, going back to what we talked about right at the start, and the reason for this is, you know, how does that, you know, if I'm providing it or HID are providing it, or it's a third party card provider that's issuing these mobile credentials, how does that integration work with NIDA, um, you know, as a case in point? How do I, you know, the simplicity for the end user going back to face recognition, it's got to be seamless, it's got to be easy for these guys to be able to deploy it. So all of those considerations need to be taken into account. You know, just as we come to the end of this, um, <clears throat> a simple example of the types of hardware that that, um, that is commonplace in the marketplace right now, wireless locking solutions to all of the new RFID hardware with NFC and Bluetooth low energy as standard. Um, but, but can we consider a way to upgrade existing sites without expense of replacing old technology and old hardware. There's certainly product, and, and I refer to that on the right hand side, there's product in the marketplace now that allow us to use um, upgrade uh, facilities using BLE to RFLE, RFID translators um, and harvesting energy from existing devices. So we don't have to replace existing infrastructure. We can upgrade what's already on the door um, with simple solutions to help you um, maximize the ability of mobile credential. So the opportunities really are, are endless. Just some of the markets that we see uh, opportunities in and the demand for discussion with our business, um, specifically hospitality, the likes of Airbnb and um, hotel groups, um, shared economy, so car high solutions, parking, shared offices, uh, and, and um, systems like that, right through to lifestyle, fitness centers, and anything that has a membership community attached to it. Just a few of the opportunities the, that we have um, and that are already looking to adopt that technology. <clears throat> so just in summary, um, you know, face recognition and mobile credential, we believe, have a part to play in a contactless access control world and market. They must coexist with an in, and integrate with existing infrastructure and the admin where cost and simplicity are essential for adoption. 
you know, this isn't future technology, it's now uh, technology. And we've got to be able to adapt as an industry and an organization and a partnership and integrated community um, to be able to meet the needs of the end user. So just to wrap up, um, you know, I hope it's been a, a useful session from myself and Suprema in regards to both face recognition and mobile credential, um, how we might all consider the options for the market and the clients that we work with and for. Uh, I wish all of you the best and I hope you all stay safe in the coming weeks. Hopefully we can get back to some normal working hours and um, let me hand you back now to, to Richard. Thanks, Jamie. Some um, some really good insights there. Thank you. Just a just a couple of questions. Um, one one that was posted by um, the audience, which sort of touches on uh, the GDPR element slightly in terms of so. Uh, Obviously, GDPR is important across the board now in all businesses, um, you know, in, especially in security as well. But in terms of when you're taking someone's biometric identity, I think it becomes even more prevalent. Um, and a couple of questions in terms of when you're storing those biometric templates from a facial recognition solution, for example, is that stored in a in a separate database if it's integrated with a CCTV system or an access control system? And, and if so, why and, and how is it stored? So um, it's a it's a great question uh, and one that it probably one of the first questions we get asked when we um, when we go in and see clients. Uh, the answer certainly in our solution is that yes um, the database of, of templates are stored in a separate separate um, database it can be on the same server it can be on the same network but it is stored separately one of the key reasons for that um, is a uh, there's there's an importance that we protect and encrypt that data um, the other side of it is the need um, you know re-enrolling um, biometric data is a lot more um, complicated and it, it requires interaction a lot more than card and mobile credential particularly so if ever there's an issue around the data that's in that database um, we need to be able to separate and protect it from you know general day-to-day -day access information so that it's a lot easier to redeploy if for example, you were moving to a new server or a new a new um, access control system was being applied, you would be able to pick it up and transfer it rather than having to get, you know, whether it's 500 or 5,000 users to come back in and re-enroll. You know, the practicality of that is really limiting and the importance of securing that data is, is critical, you know, very different to card technology. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you, you also touched on, um, you did a couple of slides on mobile credentials, and this is um, something that's very new. Can you can you sort of clarify how, how you manage the distribution of credentials, again, to mobile devices, and, and sort of a specific example, if a user loses or replaces their phone, how's that managed in the, in yeah. the future? Yeah, of course. So, so there's, there's a number of different companies out there that that are offering that that technology the way that we handle it is um, we, we have a dedicated um, mobile credential portal now that um, that can exist in a number of different environments in terms of ownership whether that be the end user that owns it whether it be the integrator that owns it as a credential provider to their client um, the way that the product is issued and the flow of that is that the credential is generated and distributed to the end user's mobile device, either by text or by um, email in a, uh, a URL that, that then embeds the mobile credential into their device. Um, that then allows the user to either in the foreground or background of the mobile, so without having to open or wait their their um, phone up, use the, the their device to access a door or a cabinet or a cage or right. whatever it may be. Now, 
there's different ways of doing that. You, we either issue the card as we would a traditional RFID card, um, and then there's a cost for uh, replenishment. If somebody loses their phone, um, we do what we call um, like backup credentials, if you like. Um, so you can reissue at no cost uh, a second credential. Um, beyond that, you would have to replace just like you would a normal card. Now, we do have other options that allow you to uh, subscription service. So it doesn't matter the number of cards that you have in a given year. You can issue them, revoke them, replace them, take them off one device, put them on another. So there's a lot of flexibility in the way that mobile cards uh, are issued. It's just dependent on size of opportunity or size of the, the, the application. Use case. Way that you yeah. Want to use it. yeah, use case demand the way that you would issue it. I would say number of credentials would demand the best way to deploy it. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Just just one last question and then we'll we'll move on to um to Michael. Um this is a question you probably can't answer. It's a hard one, but um I'm going to ask it anyway. Um mm -hmm. obviously we've seen a huge rise in facial recognition over over the last few years and given the current COVID-19 pandemic, I assume we're predicting an even larger demand for contactless solutions than even before. And given that Suprema offer different modalities, as you've touched on, fingerprint and facial, are you seeing any early early trends of market behaviour and demand over the next few years? Um, I mean, I, I think I, I sort of touched on it in the slides there that, you know, face recognition, even for the last probably 18 months, two years, has definitely been, you know, if you look at the market trends, it's it's been the most adopted or certainly the most interest in tech, in um, the biometric modality. Um, yeah. I think the current sort of COVID-19 situation, if you look at social media, what that will do is drive people to look at the options and realize that there isn't as much of a gap between what they have been using and actual you know leading technology where i think we've got to be really careful is that we don't get carried away by you know the use of facial recognition for um you know hopefully pandemics aren't a commonplace in the future and this is a a one off you know let's not get carried away and start blowing budgets on um, yeah. on products that, that are all singing or dancing when when the actual fundamental requirement is to get through a door. Um, you know, there's 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 various ways and needs. You know, the bottom line is people are still going to have to put their hands on doors. So we're not going to get away from a contact. Exactly. Yeah. From a contact. I think there's bar. a big, big education piece and, and sort of 100%. change management piece coming into this. Yeah. 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 Great. Get ourselves would be my, my my answer. And, you know, consider yeah. the whole application before you go head headlong into a you know expensive um solution yeah good stuff all right thanks jamie um so oh we'll move is hearing from michael lee who's the uk consultant manager for need app so i will just hand over to michael and michael the uh, the floor is yours yeah, thanks, Richard. Uh, really interesting uh, presentation uh, from you, Jamie, as well. So that was very good. Um, so I'm Michael Lee, UK Consultant Manager for NeedApp. Uh, I've worked in the industry for over 15 years with Access Control uh, predominantly, uh, but have fulfilled a number of different roles, right from engineer to commissioning engineer to project manager, etc. And I hope to demonstrate some of that knowledge uh, with you today by talking about um, uh, implementing best of breed technology directly into security design i um, also just want to make a quick mention to the asc um, i've been a member of the asc uh, organization for two years now and it's a testament to them that they're uh, they've supported us and uh, sponsored this event today and a, a special mention to roger noakes so you know at NEDAT, we believe we're the global leaders in access control. Uh, we've been responsible for so many innovations in the market that we take as standard, like intelligent IP devices uh, or true end-to-end -end, uh, encryption. And at, at the centre of that sits our platform, AOS. But 
we know that we're not experts in the other disciplines of the security market, such as biometrics or PSIMs. Um, of course, we've got a huge amount of uh, industry knowledge uh, within our security professionals that need that. But we work with the best of breed um, companies um, in those respective areas. So that's why it's today my pleasure that we've teamed up with um, Advances and Suprema to deliver uh, today's webinar. Um, and you can see that we work with a whole host of best of breed solutions uh, throughout the market. So big thank you to those guys. Short disclaimer about the content. Um, I am happy to share presentation at a later date, um, but it is material of need app. Um, so I want to talk to you about applying the best of breed technologies to security design. Based on NEDAP's zoning model, which is designed to help consultants and design engineers apply fundamentally access control and integrated systems to a security design in four simple steps. So the goal of having really a good zoning model is to create a layered security concept which fits the needs and the budget of the customer. It's the challenge to create a security design which meets both the requirements for security and costs. If you design a system which is too expensive, obviously your customer's not going to want to pay for it. And if you design a system which is not secure enough, your property is at risk. So the goal of the zoning is to have a structured way to determine which measures you apply and where. Another common challenge that you face is that the customer needs to be able to work with the system. If you make it too complex for the customer, they'll not be able to use the, uh, the system property and they will quickly lose interest if it's too complicated. And on the flip side, a system that's too basic will simply not meet the requirements, the operational requirements of today or potentially tomorrow. So you have to design a simple a system which is easy to use and is understandable for the customer. So why use a zoning model? Well, again, it comes down to that security versus costs and simple versus complex. In other words, you need to have something, you understand how you create a security design for a building. We think it's best to use some sort of zoning model and hopefully I'll give you uh, the, the full details on that and that's something that you can take away with you today. Other considerations, not just a zoning model, of course you always need a risk assessment when thinking about a security design. You need to think about the customer's demands. The customer might have you believe that they're always right but it's our job really to, uh, as qualified security professionals, to educate and advise sufficiently. And of course we need to take into the architect's designs we know that architects are uh, not always uh, great at uh, uh, designing uh, buildings that allow for easy installation or implementation of our security systems. So those three things are, of course, considerations for us. So NEDAP's four-step zoning model. It is a model. It's not a standard. There are other standards that are sort of similar. You think about the data center standards, EM 5600, if any of you work in data centers, but it's just a model. But we believe that if you go through these four steps, you'll have a framework from which you can determine the right measures uh, and systems for your customers. So step one is space zoning, where we look at different types of areas of work. Step two is to apply the zoning to the architect's drawings or to the floor plan to get the zoning more right. And in step three, we can introduce access control and other technology to help us safely transition between the zones. And then in finally, step four, we look at any additional security measures we may want. They can include further the, uh, integrations to third party systems. Uh, such as uh, a PSIM, like, like uh, Advances WingGuard or, uh, or a CCTV system, etc. Or it could just be implementing more features that's already under the hood of, of the system that you may have uh, suggested or installed, like your access control system. So step one is space zoning. This will lead us to a schematic overview of the zone. So let's just take 
a look and break down our building. So we're just going to take a fairly typical example of space zoning. So if we think about external public zone, we often, well, it, it refers directly to public space, the road space, uh, therefore in not control or not in the uh, property of the customer. We then have external private space, okay? So internal private space can be something like a car park. So it's it's still uh, private, but it's external to the building. And we have internal public space. So in most companies, this will be some kind of reception area. So again, it's internal, but it's free to the public. We then look at zone three, internal non-working space, areas like hallways, meeting rooms, areas where people aren't actually fulfilling their work but is still part of the company's uh, private property. We have internal working space. Typically, this is the work where it's, work is actually being done, the place where work's being done, things like offices. Um, but then there's two more further steps than that. There's the restricted uh, working space. So this is an area that isn't always freely accessible for employees, but it's still a working space. So for example, in our case, We'll use something like a lab area for where you'll need special safety training. And then the final zone that we would use is a, a, a restricted non-working space. So typically areas where they are isolated, where people do not uh, carry out daily works. These can be rooms like an IT room, server rooms, um, where people do access them, but it's not there. It's not their, their, their desk or it's not where they're going to be uh, habitating for a long period of time. So just by going through some simple areas in a building and categorizing them into zones, we get a nice kind of six zone model. Um, and we've we've coded them, which I think help. That's key that we can then apply to our uh, floor plan or architect's design. So again, going to the second step is applying that zoning, uh, uh, that zoning system to a standard floor plan and seeing um, how we can get it right. So if we take a fairly typical floor plan, as I say, we've got our lab areas, we've got our hazard stock and server rooms, which are our restricted non-working spaces. We've just applied that color code to a simple floor plan and immediately, it can help you break down and identify the type of uh, security measures we need to put into place to transition into each zone. Okay, so between zones, I should actually say. So step three and step four is really where we get into the nitty gritty. So step three is, you know, once we've zoned the building, we've made sure that we've color coded or we've marked out you know, the right areas that make sense that you've not got a zone six area directly adjacent to a zone one, et cetera, et cetera. And we've really thought through our floor plan. What we can now do is focus on how we transition between those zones. We're going to keep it quite simple at the moment because remember in step four, we're going to add additional measures. Okay. So how might we transition from zone zero to zone one, which if we think about was our private space into, sorry, our public space into something like an external uh, non-working area like a car park. Well, we can use a number of different technologies. Typically, we all see an intercom and that intercom is usually used for visitors. For employees, we could implement something like a long range reader. These particular readers, uh, readers are designed to read up to 10 meters in distance and in com combination with boosters and tags fitted inside the cars means that you can identify staff because the tags will be hosted inside the cars and as they approach to the barrier, to the reader, the reader will read uh, the tag or the respective booster and it will allow them um, clear and easy access into the car park. We can, of course, add additional uh, measures, something like an AMPR camera, um, you know, that, that can integrate, which can read a license plate that, that can then be linked directly to a person with 
within the access system again to allow automatic entry into the car park at designated times thinking about going from a zone one to a zone two so that's external private space into internal public space again for people that aren't really traveling by a car people that are traveling by foot we still need an intercom to help uh, help manage the visitors uh, wanting to access into the reception area this is of course where we can introduce a typical um, classic if you like card reader an RFID card reader of you know Jamie mentioned in his presentation different types of card technologies available in the market and that really is a whole nother conversation but this is where you could introduce um, a, a regular card reader for example and then we can have a door sensor that's linked to the access control that can again it can allow access uh, based on someone approaching the downside of that is obviously that you know you're not necessarily reading a credential um, with uh, a door sensor it's just going to open for everyone but again if we think about our risk assessment and our customers demands that may be okay you know it might be okay for the general public to enter into our zone two into our reception area you know we see that most you know tenant buildings and most offices and most companies will welcome visitors into their reception area without any sort of a credential check so from zone two to zone three again we can have a normal card reader but we could integrate that into a turnstile or a speed lane so that you can present a card so there's no physical reader it's embedded into a turnstile or a speed lane but like Jamie said, you know, the smarter ways now, uh, we're moving, the industry's moving and adopting uh, smarter technology, mobile, uh, mobile credentials. So this is where you can use uh, potentially your mobile phone to access um, at a reception area. You can use a combination of things. It could be a mobile credential like what Supreme offer, which again would integrate into access control. But we could have a QR code, which is a you know a bit of a simpler method than a than a true mobile uh, credential. These can just be emailed or text out, um, and it would work in the same way that uh, your boarding pass might work at an airport. And again, there are readers available that can read all of these devices at once. So the reader on the right, that's a, a, a mace reader that can read a a mobile credential, a regular RFID card and a QR code all at the same time so it gives us a much smarter way of entering the building again thinking about your customer demands it might be that the, you you know the, the company would like all visitors and all staff to uh, check in or present at reception or to a security guard so it does differ from from site to site of course moving from a zone three to a zone four again uh, you know it's still a secure area so we're, we're entering into a private working space now so here we do really need to make sure that persons that are entering these areas are authorized people so they need to be carrying some sort of credential we could have a long range reader but this is a long range person reader so it will read up to about a meter or just beyond um, giving a, a more of a hands-free experience and these can ideally be used for uh, people that are carrying items, porters or cleaners, or for uh, the more uh, disabled uh, access, uh, people that might struggle uh, having to uh, operate doors, etc. This can be uh, a reader that you could implement to read that person approaching the door at about a meter. And then we have things like wireless, where again, these can be a bit of a cost saving on your installations and on your design. These types of door uh, locking devices, wireless locking devices are, are ideal for lower level security doors. Uh, they're battery operated and communicate wirelessly to, uh, to, to hubs, wireless hubs, and typically a wireless hub uh, can connect to about 16 wireless locks. This example that you're seeing in the, in the third box there is uh, an ASA Rabloy product, um, but there are also many on the market uh, that you can choose from, uh, which would operate in the same way and would integrate into your access control system in the same way. So it just gives you a bit of a cost saving on design um, and it can save on your installation as well. 
So we're now entering into restricted working space. So we're going from a zone five to a zone six. So it might be necessary to implement additional verification measures at, at this stage in our, in our building zoning model. So here we have a, uh, uh, an RFID card reader, uh, but this will ask for a PIN number after the person has presented an authorized card or badge. So we now have two actions to perform and the additional PIN verification means that if the person's card is lost or misplaced and it does accidentally fall into the wrong hands, that the area is still secure because that person would have to know PIN number as well. But depending, again, depending on the type of building or the type of client or the customer's demands or the risk, risk assessment that you've carried out, it may be necessary if you introduce something a little bit more stringent. And this is where we can look at um, a mobile, uh, a biometric uh, fingerprint reader. So a good access control system will allow the operators to manage biometric data and user templates from a single front end without having to operate a different system for the biometric reader. And this is again, something that Jamie's touched on. You know, we want to, yes, you know, it's, it's that weighing off, weighing off the, uh, the, the, the requirements, but then the ease of use, we don't want to make things too complicated uh, for, for our clients and our customers to use. So it's important that when you do look at these kinds of integrated biometric technologies, that you have ones that can some can work from a seamless uh, single front end. Um, so you've got that good integration that provides a little bit more added value uh, to your client, not keep having to open two different systems to, to perform the same task effectively. And then moving into our final and most secure zone. So this is our restricted non-working space. It's something like a, a server room or a, a comms room or et cetera, et cetera. So again, we can have a biometric reader, but here you can see the biometric reader differs uh, slightly because it's also got a pin, uh, pin pad on it. Um, and you can also present a card here. So we can actually have a three factor authentication on a single device that's communicating and integrated to your access control system. So three factor authentication means that you'd have to present all three or a combination of the three factors in order to gain access to this area. So the three factors would be biometrics, so that's your finger template, a card and the pin. So you're really, you're instantly adding a much higher level of security to enter into this zone. But again, you may feel that this is not enough. And again, it's down to customer demand and risk assessment. So you can start looking at facial recognition and Jamie touched upon it there. And again, same things apply there. You know, you want to look at a system that can integrate properly and well with your existing infrastructure, with your existing uh, access control system. And a good access control system will allow that type of integration seamlessly. We could introduce things like people counters and tailgate detectors um, as an additional measure. Um, this could um, help us identify how many people in the room are in the room and to stop tailgating. Um, again, intelligent devices that can help us secure our most vulnerable uh, zones. So that's very quickly, you know, the uh, the things that we can introduce at each zone. So let's just look on on what our floor plan could potentially look like if we were to implement all of those things. Uh, into our basic floor plan. So coming into the car park, intercom, long distance reader, card reader, and or AMPR. As we come into the reception area, intercom, card reader, and motion sensor. Going into our turnstile, our uh, beyond our reception area, using speed gates or turnstiles with QR codes or mobile credentials. Going into our next zone, a card reader, hands-free reader, so giving us that access for staff that have impediments or are carrying large bulky items. And here we think it's appropriate where we could potentially introduce wireless online locking devices. Going into our zone uh, five then, uh, 
we can have card and pin and or biometric depending on what we see fit for purpose to enter into that restricted working space and then finally going into our most critical areas and our restricted non-working spaces we can have three-factor authentication possibly a people counter um, and we can introduce something like two-man rules as well um, with the people counter so what additional security measures might we able to implement um, i know we've already put a lot of technology uh, onto our different zones but now we're thinking about uh, security measures uh, things like different rules that we can implement that can help us and i'll give you a few examples of those quickly so some additional security measures we've already discussed um, additional verification using pin or uh, biometrics when we were looking at zone six and seven with our fingerprint or facial recognition reader we can implement things like time schedules anti pass back rules airlocks manager first rules and two man rules and i will just briefly give you a flavor of what each of those could so verification we see it as any uh, is uh, something that you have, something that you know, and something that you are, um, and a combination of those depends on the uh, technology or devices that you choose. It should enable you to use any or all of those in any one time. When we look at time schedules, you know there are different types of time schedules. Yeah, we can have a few examples. You know doors that are opening automatically on a time schedule we can also think about um, when someone can access uh, a specific set of doors for example but we can also apply time schedules to our technology so if you think about our card and pin reader for example we can apply a time schedule to actually say do you know what you're only required to use the card aspect of this device uh, during working hours but after working hours, you are then required to use the pin. So it becomes flexible in that sense as well. So we can have a combination of all three of those types of time schedules and apply that to our, uh, uh, to our design. So our reception area now looks like um, uh, using a time schedule. We can apply that to our, uh, uh, to our door sensor, for example to give us that additional flex, uh, ad additional flexibility, I should say. Thinking about what anti-passback could give us, there's a few different variants that you can apply, again, depending on the zone type, true, anti-passback, global, and timed. Anti-passback can be programmed that when an authorized person badges in an entrance or a card reader, they must always have to badge out before trying to re-enter. This stops anyone trying to pass their card back over the speed gate for their friend to uh, to badge in that's typically best deployed on something like a turnstile or a speed gate but as i said there's lots of different variants of, of, of anti-pass back you know we can think about global anti-pass back where someone might badge onto site and there's a number of different entrances and uh, entrances and exits so you know they're not always going to be coming on and off site at the same door or at the same card reader so it's important to have a system that can be flexible to allow uh, the exit by a completely different door to what they might have entered in but the system can still imply and apply anti-pass back in the same way so if we think about an airlock so again this could be typically used uh, for some sort of uh, a clean room, for example, um, where, so for our lab, it would be ideal for our lab, so that no contamination of the area happens. Um, with an airlock system, you know, when we think about airlocks, we think about lots of relays, inputs and outputs, lots of complex wiring, okay? With a, with a good access control system, what you should be able to do is, is program this via the software so that the intelligence is in the door controllers and in the server so that there's no complex additional wiring inputs and outputs and relays etc however a lot of systems that means that the server must always be online okay with a 
again with with a good system with uh, that has peer-to-peer -peer functionality at controller level um, it means that if the intelligence is in the door controllers and the door controllers can communicate via the network independently of the server it means that your airlocks will function seamlessly at all times and that's really important again that when you're thinking about these types of systems anti-put or these types of additional verification or security measures anti-pass back an airlock if the intelligence is in the server so if the server goes down you lose that intelligence with that particular feature if the intelligence is in the door controller and you have peer-to-peer -peer functionality you will never lose that functionality in your security system because the intelligence is at, at door level and that's really really crucial we can apply that airlock to our lab on our design there we go so we can see card and pin biometric or and or biometric uh, and an airlock then the last couple manage a first rule um, so the way we can manage this um, is for authorizations of employees in a certain room depend on the presence of a manager or a supervisor so it could be that we only want uh, normal staff or, or, or people with a certain access level to enter into a specific zone if there is a manager or someone with a superior access uh, rights or authorization rights are already in that area. So we could apply that to our zone six, something like a hazard, sure that a manager is always in there first so that a normal staff member does not go in there unattended. And then finally, a two-man rule. Um, it differs from the manager first rule in the way that it needs two authorised persons to badge within a set period of time to enter. So instead of one manager being in there first, this might need two managers to badge within, say, 10 or 15 seconds for access to be granted. And this might be applicable to our most restricted area, our zone, uh, our zone sevens, our, uh, our restricted non-working space. So there we can apply biometric technology with a two-man rule. Okay. So that's a nice overview of NEDAP's four-step zoning model. Hope you found it insightful. It does mean that you have to think a little bit more about the technologies that you might think about using. And it's important then to think about, okay, what systems might I specify or might I choose? Because not all systems are going to be intelligent um, as ours to be able to uh, implement all of those features and integrations at once but again that's why we have the technology partner program and that's why we work with companies like Suprema to, to provide the best uh, biometric solutions and work with advances to provide the best PCM solutions and together we've got our best of breed model and best of breed security design. Uh, thanks for listening I've been Michael Lee feel free to reach out to me directly on email or contact me on LinkedIn and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, good. Um, this is the first time I've seen that. So it was really a simple methodology to follow the zoning model. And I think what's also good is you've um, given me some work for my children so I can get them colouring in, colouring in um, plans yeah. of buildings now. So that's good. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think you you um, you mentioned it when you were talking about zone six to seven, and we hear a lot about integrations um, yeah. and, and possibilities to connect third party systems. But w what, in your opinion, NEDAP's opinion and experience, what makes an integration good or bad? Yeah, so I think you know integrations. I've written a few articles on this, and integrations, you know, it's a bit of a, a, a an overused word and a misunderstood word um, because they're intelligent integrations where it's done at server or controller level um, where uh, the intelligence is really two-way and there's bi-directional communication so there's information being passed both ways and there's there's a sort of handshakes going on and whatnot but there's a lot of people that talk about integrations in terms of a connection so it could be a wired uh, output to an input and they say yeah we we can integrate to that or you know yeah. in a consultant specification um you know 
uh, or we need an integration with the lift, for example, and it's just a set of relays. You know, to us, that's not really an intelligent integration. Yeah, it provides a nice uh, additional feature set to the client, but to us, an, a good integration is always done in an intelligent way, um, usually at IP level where there's bi-directional communication um, and generally there's not a whole load of wiring inputs and outputs used. It's thinking smarter as the technology advances, the integration should, uh, sh should also advance. So for us, it's intelligent, bi-directional communication um, and it's not just a, a, you know, a load of wiring relays, inputs and outputs. Yes. Yeah, that, that's good. Um, that's good. Do you, before we move on, because uh, I'm slightly conscious of time, is and this is a question I ask um, most customers and uh, partners when we're, we're we're dealing with them just on a daily basis is what's the biggest challenge you face in your business? So, f from NEDAP's perspective, what do you think the biggest problem you face in access control today? Um, Personally, as I say, I run the consultant program for NEDAP and, you know, I work a lot with consultants and I think it's very easy, not just with consultants, but with installers as well, is to get into habits. You know, you're working with a system, you become familiar with systems and you install the same system over and over again. Yeah, you know, it can help you, you know, learn effectively and, and um you know, save some cost here and there. But within a very short space of time, a blink of an eye, our market changes and there's new technologies available. And I've seen that people are installing systems that are already out of date. You know, they're, they're using yeah. insecure technologies. Um, you know, they're using systems that don't have the correct level of cyber awareness and cyber functionality to protect against the ever advancing cyber threats. And it's, I think it's habitual use of installation and and uh, and, sp and specifying project uh, products yeah. just because, you know, it's it's what they know. I think people need to open their eyes a little bit and and look at what else is out there, you know, so in order to to achieve the very best of uh, what they can do. Yeah, it's a really it's a really good point. I mean, because I came from a system integration background, so I've been an yeah, installer of systems. Yeah, like, like need up and and it, it's getting that balance between having your engineers competent and the competency within the business to represent that product well and install it well and yeah. maintain it well whilst also having your eye on the newest innovations and technologies coming through to ensure that you're you're at the forefront of the market for your customers yeah. and for Absolutely. you as a business so it is, it is a, a balancing Train, act yeah training right. training is a huge part you know that's yeah. why we we have a, a big training platform at need that you know without the training and the and the uh uh, sharing of information, you know, no one gets anywhere. So training, right, Richard, is, is, a, is a huge part of that. Good. Thank you. Well, that was um, that was great. Um, so for our final part, I'll hand over to uh, our technical manager, uh, Alan Dickinson. So Alan, you should now have control. I do, I do. Excellent. Thank you very much, Richard. Hi, everyone. Um, hope uh, hope you've enjoyed the presentation so far. Uh, my name's Alan Dickinson, and I'm the technical manager for Advances UK and Ireland. So just before I start on my little bit, firstly, just to mention uh, the ASC, uh, and just a quick thank you for the sponsorship of the event, and thanks to all the team for the promotion in the event today. So yeah, thanks for everyone taking the time out to come and listen to us, discuss our various technologies, and hopefully you'll gain some knowledge or at least an insight into the technology that we provide and the interlinking between the technologies. Um, also, a quick one, quick thanks to Mike, Jamie, and Richard for taking part in today's webinar. Um, so yeah, so starting with my presentation, as I said, my name's Alan Dickinson. Um, just a little bit about me, I'm 20, in fact 21 years just about in the security industry uh, this year, um, working primarily within open integration. So I've most of my career has been spent uh, building an open integration platform. So I started a software business with two people uh, building an open integration platform from scratch, from design through to development, build. Uh, delivery out to the client and maintenance. 
Um, and you know, these products is one of the most commonly used platforms in the UK at the moment. Um, so yeah, so that's a little bit about my background. Uh, today's presentation is a high level guide to open integration. Um, and I'm gonna really split my presentation into two parts. So the first part's going to cover what open integration is and try and cut through with some of the myths and acronyms that we use within the industry, try and cut through the marketing terminology and really talk about what they mean. Um, and then the second part is going to be cover what integration looks like in the past, what it looks like currently in the present, and what it's going to hopefully, or in theory, look like moving into the future. Um, and primarily in that, how businesses are going to deal with the increased demand and what the next integrated, integrated technologies can be or could be. So moving on to my first slide, I guess after 20 years in the industry, I would say the most common questions that I get asked start with, starting with the mo first and most important question is what is open integration? What does it really mean? What is it? Um, the next one, yep, what does it mean? What benefits does it bring? How much does it cost? And do I really need something so complex? These have to be the most common questions. So moving on, from that, just to answer some of them questions very quickly. So what is open integration? So you will probably have heard some of the, uh, the uh, terms that I'm going to list below. So PSIM, PSIM Plus, CSIM, VMS, and SMS. So these, these are terms that I use to explain um, different products, but essentially, all are a form of open integration now they've all got a theory and their own set of meaning however i think i think most here will agree that this criteria is 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 somewhat confusing for for most people especially the especially end users but still to include the consultants and the integrators to some extent so it's which which really for me which product fits into which category and you know the products that are the brand within these areas do they really cover the criteria etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's in all honesty in my personal opinion this is quite a bit of a minefield um so i think it's important for everyone to keep into mind when they're looking for a product like um, an open integration platform is to start to think about the functions that they want rather trying to rather than trying to look for a CSIM or a PSIM or a, trying to really look and focus on the key features that you would like to exploit from within your technology. And I think that really starts to give you a much better approach and you probably will get a better result out of the end of it. Um, I think the key to finding a good system is to ensure for me that the, com that the manufacturer of the system is either completely agnostic or as close as possible. Uh, so basically when I say that, what I actually mean is looking for a platform where the where the manufacturer doesn't have any interest in selling you other other products like a camera or a, an access control platform or something like that it's all about making sure that you can harness the best of breed technology and integrate all of that together um, and ensuring that the manufacturer has the same approach so open integration companies have excellent partners such as NEDARP and Suprema that do exactly this, they have the best of breed technology and then it's our job to bring that technology together and let, let you, our customers, harness that technology. I think if, if companies have other products, they're very keen to sell you them rather than trying to help you find what's best for you. So that's, that, that's a, key, a key thing from, from my perspective. And one final note on this slide is obviously being, being agnostic does give them businesses um, you know, more access to the uh, SDKs and protocols that are available to integrate them other devices um, as they have no competitive products to that other company. So that's, that, that's a little bit about some of the terminology. So what does open integration mean? Well, open integration from my perspective is about taking lots of different objects and as you can see on this slide lots of different sensors out at field level so cctv cameras uh fire sensors proximity sensors uh, biometric sensors it could be weather data it could be 
lighting technology, it could be wet, uh, energy management, it could be anything, anything that you can consider integrating. And to bring that through the automation layer, so on the automation layer, we see lots of different things such as servers, panels, and, and in today's world, especially on the right hand side of the slide, you'll see the cloud data as well, where the data is projected from the, from the device up into the cloud into some form of storage. And what we end up with in turn um, is a management layer at the top end that looks very much like this with a very clustered workstation, um, lots of different web browsers um, with different information coming through, email clients, uh, printers from all the fire panels giving you information, lots and lots of different systems, but complete inability to decipher what each system is doing or no inability to speak to each other across across the network in, in any detail. So ultimately what open integration is trying to bring you to is bringing all of that together into one piece of software. Now, this should give you lots of further benefits. So what are the capabilities of an open integration platform? So I'm not going to go into these categories in too much detail, but when you're looking for a platform, it should be much more than just security it should be more around the safety and security uh of, of course but also we should be looking at building in things from building technologies communication based technologies iot endpoints all of this should be should be input sides to to an open integration platform and again you should be able to choose the best of breed technology in all of them areas as well as harnessing the technology that you have at the moment and protecting your legacy investment um, so Alongside of all of that, we some of the more powerful things that come with open integration is being able to have guided workflows or dynamic workflows and have the operators guided through what they need to do in the event of different types of events happening. Um, and the operator should almost not have to think, it's, everything should be very much in front of them and very uh, simplified. Um, from a perspective of viewing that, having CAD plans and GIS systems, mobile device access on both iOS and Android, um, et cetera. And on the back of all of that, being able to piggyback on outward bound integrations to ticket management systems, event management systems, and at the very end of everything, being able to evaluate efficiently using reporting technology. Um, so there's some of the capabilities you can expect to see within an open integration platform. So what benefits does open integration bring? So I'm not gonna delve too far into these because of the time that we have today. Uh, however, one of the key benefits has to be a reduction in training costs. A single simple interface for event handling, which essentially takes away the need to have all the disparate systems that we saw on the previous slide. It means the operators trained on one system and that's a huge reduction, but also an increase on knowledge, which means they can react much better. Increased compliance for certain, so you've got full encrypted audit trail of the operator activity and full traceability of all their actions that are taken by the audit log. A future-proof single system for life, so this has to be one of my personal favourites from a technical perspective. So being able to uh, provide systems to end users that are their system for life, they should, if you purchase from by the correct system there should be really no need to replace that the the manufacturer should be proactive in integrating all of the latest technology bringing everything to the table so there should never really be a need to change that main system again provided everything all the latest technology is kept up to the up to date and compatible increased awareness increased situational awareness so having dynamic workflows to assist with your event handling as i managed pre as i discussed previously Increased ability to produce the statistics at the end gives you overall awareness of what is what is happening within the operation. Um, operation operational efficiencies. So obviously, due to all of the things above, that should lead to a reduction in time dealing with events due to simpler processes, um, a reduction in information exchange due to having both inward bound and outward bound exchanges. So you're not going to have people going from a piece in then or open integration however you want to refer to it then back out to 
uh, an email system to tell somebody that something's happened. The, the both inward bound and uh, outward bound integration should simplify that process for you. And then to one of the more common questions of how much does it cost? Well, I think this has been um, in history has been part of the problem with the analogies of PCM, etc. That I managed that I spoke about earlier. People believe that I think that these things sort of start at six figures when it's actually far from the case and systems like this can generally start at very kind of low cost in the low thousands of pounds. And I think the short answer that I like to give is probably in short, not as much as you would think. Um, and, and we need to encourage people to start to look at integration and bringing everything together in a cohesive way um, much more because, as I said, it's not. The, the costs aren't as high as people believe. And on to one of my favorite slides is, do I really need something so complex? So in answer to that, the answer is, well, no, you shouldn't have something complex. Everything should be very seamless. It should be a very clean interface. It should be very simplistic to use. You should have very simple workflow technology to guide you through all of the different types of events that you have. So if you have a system like this, an open integration system, and it is complex, maybe it needs reevaluating and maybe thinking about what, you know, how you're using it or um, is there a better way or a better system out there? Because really it should not be complex. The systems are there to make things simple. So that's really the first part of the presentation of what, what is open integration. Um, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about how integrations looked in the past and the present and moving on into the future. So a timeline for growth within integration. So I think we started kind of right back in the early 90s. Certainly when I started developing these kind of platforms, there was analog CCTV matrices, analog fire panels that would give you very simple fire or fault, but very little else coming through from the systems. Very simplistic RS-232 intruder panels. Um, and yeah, integration was definitely uh, not seen as the route forward. In fact, I think most, most not all I should emphasize, but most manufacturers um, at this point quite simply said, we would prefer to be your sole supplier rather than bringing everything together. However, uh, that kind of changed in as an extension to this in the early 2000s, where I think it's fair to say in the security industry, we started to see a real change. Video became either recorded from analog onto hard drives um, from a DVR point of view. IP cameras were really starting to see the, we were really starting to see them hit the market. Uh, the panel manufacturers from a fire and uh, BMS, et cetera, we're all starting to think, how can we move into the IP market? And even if that was only putting a 232 uh, IP converter on the board, it was everybody was starting to look through into that. So integration had really started to pick up pace, but still they were kind of um, people uh, kind of, I guess, stuck a little bit in the 90s. However, in today's world, I think with the invention, as Jamie kind of mentioned back into his presentations um, around the invention of the smartphone and everything else, um, I think it's, it's fair to say that integration is quite quite open and most people are looking towards um, integrating their technology with other people and hence we can choose the best of breed. Uh, but today we've got a huge broad spectrum of building management, IP CCTV, uh, access control, fire detection systems, BM, uh, uh, building management, energy management systems, incident and event management, etc. Um, and obviously, we're starting to see the cybersecurity role of these systems coming into play as well, uh, partnering up with IT to monitor IT networks, and also the, uh, which I think truly is probably key, um, and uh, being able to monitor the cyber secure elements of a network or a corporate environment as well is uh, critical in these environments. Um, and what can we expect the future to hold? Well, we're going to discuss that a bit more in a second, but I think we can certainly expect 
much more specific and complex project requirements and definitely, definitely a huge demand for more integrations. Um, and we'll talk around some of the technologies that I've listed on that slide a little bit more in a second. So what are the future technologies? So I think we're definitely going to, if we're not already seeing a huge uh, increase in the need for integration with IoT sensors. Um, some of the clients that we're looking with at the moment are looking at air quality sensing, uh, being able to sense vibrations on uh, shipping lanes within uh, warehouse environments, temperature sensing in data center environments. And I think the IoT devices lend themselves much easier to kind of put there and forget, and they still keep feeding the information into kind of big data sources and being able to pull that down. I think augmented reality is something that we kind of will expect to come through if when again if we're not seeing some of this already so augmented reality for those who are on here that aren't or fair is kind of where even some of the uh retailers are adopting this in a huge way where you can kind of go onto a website and pick um a sofa for your living room point your camera in the right direction it places the the sofa in the in the pictorial view of the camera within the tablet or or phone and I think we're going to see some of that um, coming through into our world, for example, within airports, being able to, the camera looks over to a plane, it would show the plane where it's destined for, which stand it's, it's going to, et cetera, uh, being able to look at um, baggage trolleys and which, where they, which plane, which stand they're destined for, their serial number, uh, on time, not on time, et cetera. Uh, and I think we'll start to see views of things like that for certain within within our industry. Uh, big data extracting, we've kind of covered some of this, but being able to extract data to complement the events that are being captured. So being able to look at data sources from internal databases or maybe even external online databases around data that's being captured and being able to create more and use tools like Power BI to create more informed decisions. And that's kind of harnesses up with the AI. So being able to mine data, being able to create event probability and create best response based on previous history, um, monitoring of video streams for behavioral patterns and using lessons learned from that to be able to create better response, better workflows, better operator efficiencies, and being able to drive that through uh, products like ours. Um, BIM. Now, this is a bit of a strange one, but uh, incidentally, we're seeing quite an uptake in being able to bring BIM modeling through into, uh, into platforms like this. So being able to use, um, being able to take some of the building, in, building models, being able to uh, plot things within the model, being able to use it and extract data also for creating smart buildings. And that's going to be quite uh, a big thing, it seems, moving forward. So there's some of the technologies that uh, we're looking to uh, move forward with. Um, but with all of them technologies coming online and the increase in integration, I think it's fair to say um, that with the success of these kind of systems um, in providing the operators and providing transparency, traceability for the management teams, and as these as integration becomes more commonplace because of the smartphones etc everybody wants their social social messenger accounts partnered uh, all together in one app or their bank account links with their accounting app etc etc as all of these kind of things are pushed through then success does come unfortunately for systems like ours at a cost so the demand is increasing for new interfaces the demand then leads to much more requirement from businesses um, to, in, to maintain them interfaces. Um, and having over 500 of them for some businesses takes quite a lot of maintaining. So being able to then uh, have market or project specific extensions, all of this is becoming quite complex. Every business at some point has to, a limit on the resource that they can put to this. And what we're finding is that you're starting to see in, in general, every business is longer realization periods for these coming through because there's so much demand. Um, so to counteract that, um, to create the, one of the things that we feel that we that you can do as 
as a business is create strong technology partnerships, hence the focus of today's uh, presentation. So to the benefits of a strong technology partnership for uh, for open integration would mean that we have continuous interface development. So being able to ensure increased compatibility with the partners, being able to ensure we have increased availability of the interfaces coming through. Realization of the full feature set. So ensuring that we can extract every single feature from the manufacturer's interface and being able to bring them through into the platform and being able to extract them and give them feature sets out to the customers and deeper integration to the hardware of the manufacturer, uh, such as NEDAF, where um, Advances can speak directly with the hardware and act as a resilience feature within this. So it's all about extracting them, not just with NEDAF, but with everybody and being able to get as close to your partners as possible. It enables efficient project delivery. So businesses supporting each other with that close relationship and working together to ensure that the expected results are achieved. Um, increased collaboration, so being able to uh, share integration features and products earlier, share the roadmap so that you can both plan integrations and ensure new products are available as integrations as quick as possible. And ultimately cost savings, so working collaboratively on, collaboratively on projects should ensure that the end users are essentially saving money. So they should be able to come back to the, come back to the uh, um, the uh, collaboration, being able to work together, deciding what features are and are not required from each business and to ensure that the customer is only spending the money they're really required to spend. Another issue will be how to get these interfaces into the system. And I can only talk from um, an advances point of view and not how other open integrations systems will work and how they will harness all these extra integrations. But our solution to this is uh, called AOP. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how, how we as a business have approached this. So as this slide says, instead of trying to meet the challenges solely by increasing the resource and putting more people on the payroll, to it's important to try and create more efficient ways for people to be able to integrate and for the business as itself to be able to integrate with third party products so one of the things here is to be able to simplify and accelerate the interface development so basically being able to create a simplified framework which means that the development of these interfaces can be uh, performed much faster so taking the lead time down significantly um, and also creating a unified interface um, for third-party developers so that they can use it to develop interfaces as well so they they're not solely reliant on you as a business because lots of businesses do have their own development teams that they would like to use as also so how does this work so what we have in most systems, uh, most open integration systems that have been developed over this period of time is a presentation layer, a logic layer and a data layer within the application. Um, these having, you know, intricate knowledge of how these three layers work, the core, the core of the application, the individual control panels, the comms between the systems, et cetera, is it takes years and years of a developer getting up to speed and working with the solutions and the consequence of that is the only people that can program in uh, interfaces into an application are people that have profound understanding of the target and its subsystems so this this is time consuming hugely expensive and it takes longer to implement um, different interfaces so our solution to this moving forward into the future is to provide APIs. So the two APIs um, that we are looking to provide are a UI API and a SDK API, interface SP API. So these, these mean that uh, what we're providing is a, essentially a component in which anybody, it could be contract developers, it could be an in-house developer for the clients, it could basically be anyone who has knowledge of programming can pick up, um, pick up our API 
and design integrations into the system. It also means that internally we will save a huge amount of time. We believe that we'll uh, take an interface development down from around two months for some down to around down to around two to three weeks. Um, so the the cost saving, the integration uh, amount of integrations that can be completed, etc., will increase um, massively um, to add to the list of kind of over 500 interfaces. So all of that technology garble, what does it really mean for you? It means that we've created a future-proof system. So being able to allow other people to integrate is giving people a future-proof system. Uh, you're expanding the scope because, as I said earlier, the IoT sensors, the BIM uh, mapping, et cetera, all of this is going to require development. So you're, in, you're in, in expanding the scope of the product to enable you to react faster to what the industry demands. Uh, you're giving the third party the ability to not be fully reliant on on advances or any other other open integration provider as uh, solely, uh, which means that they can develop things themselves, and you're extending the performance of the product in its entirety. So it's quite quite a change in the way of thinking uh, for for open integration providers, but it's quite a good way and it leads down but like i said back to the smartphone route where you can have like a marketplace of interfaces and again going back to the cost model this should start to look uh, much better also for people looking for systems like this so some of the key takeaways from from this presentation um, is ensuring that the platform is fully agnostic it's ensuring that the life cycle costs do not increase to ensure that you have a fully, a good longevity of the system and ensure that you know what the costs are from day one. So there should not be no, there should be no real support increase. There should be, uh, the system should be future proof and from a forward thinking company to ensure that they maintain uh, compatibility with the latest technologies. It should ideally have an open API structure and evaluate the systems that you look at based on key benefits and not on the marketing efforts. Simple, clean and intuitive user interfaces, open, scalable and transparent cost models. And try not to get bogged down in the acronyms and terminology that is used within the industry. And that's it for the end of my presentation. So thanks all for listening. Again, thanks to the ASC for working with us to present this. And thanks to all the other presenters. And I hope everyone stays safe and well. Thanks very much. Thanks, Alan. Excellent. Um, I did have I did have one question, but you actually answered it towards the end of the the end of the presentation in terms of like the methodology followed to get a good technology partnership and obviously coming from a system integration side it for me it was two things ensuring that you're extracting as much functionality from the SDK or the API to pull into the the front end uh, for example with Wingard and the second is then keeping on top of that so ensuring that if need at release some new features that we're constantly as a, as a business developing that so that the end user can realize the benefit of it and that those were the two key things that i sort of took away from that um important. yeah i think i think it's um i think it's clear that uh, you have to have a key methodology for integrations as well so that if if a client requests an integration or or a partner has a new piece of technology it's all about having a clear defined process so that um you can take away uh what they want from that uh interface being able to evaluate it provide the provide the end user or consultant with a list of things that are possible prior to even integrating yeah. so you're almost committing to what they're going to get before an integration and then on the back of that as i said previously having a clear strategy for how much and a clear concise cost model to how much the the end user is going to pay for that yeah, yeah. A lot of integrations are, are project driven and it is about scoping it correctly, understanding those business requirements and then setting the expectations of the end user, um, which is really important. But thank you for that, Alan. Great. Um, 
So that brings us to the end of the webinar. Um, thanks to our speakers and thanks to everyone for attending. Uh, thank you to the ASC. Uh, a copy of handouts and feedback form will be sent out via email. Please give us uh, the feedback, good or bad, um, so we can replace some of the speakers or, or, um, <laughs> or no, good or bad, so that we can improve future events and webinars. All our presenters' contact details you've seen, um, you can get all of them on LinkedIn. Um, so yeah, have a great afternoon, stay safe and goodbye.